Hey, welcome back. Today I'm compiling a video out of old, old, very old footage. This is almost two years old. I still had to shop in the basement. And I was never sure if I'm going to compile a coherent video out of this footage. But after talking to the customer I made these parts for, he gave his OK to make a video out of it. And here we go. This was a batch of parts, very large batch. I'm only showing some of the parts. Also, I'm not showing a complete assembly. Please don't ask what those parts are for. It doesn't really matter for showing the machining because it's still neat parts. Just enjoy the parts them by themselves. It's mechanical art here. <laughs> so let's have a look at, at some of these parts. I was blowing compressed air through the back of the spindle uh, to clear the chips a little bit. Okay, there we go. Part is bored. Now we can take it out and prepare the mandrel that we need to turn the OD. These parts will get fairly thin walled. And by first putting in the bore and then supporting the full ID with a mandrel or an arbor, whatever you want to call it, chances of destruction of the, of the thing are relatively low. If you try to turn the OD and then bore it out to a wall thickness of one millimeter, like the drawing specs, or two millimeters, uh, chances would be high that it deforms and flies apart. And we need a mandrel uh, anyway, because we need to do some milling work on it too. That's, that's a pretty beautiful finish on the bore here. The insert I'm using is a DCMT insert size uh, 07 with a 0.4 millimeter corner radius and it's a sharpened and polished insert for L. This is a molded insert. Well, both are molded, but these are get, get ground afterwards. Um, this is an insert for steel, stainless, and this one is for aluminium and brass and other non-ferrous materials. Uh, these get ground after molding and they have a razor sharp cutting edge here and here uh, all around and due to the high polished um, top surface the chip doesn't stick to them. They are not very prone to a build up edge. Uh, these, if run in soft materials, tend to get a built up edge and they are not as sharp. The, the cutting edge on these has a tiny radius. Did you see that horrendous burr in the last cut that the insert pushed ahead of itself? Uh, that means that it's time to ditch this one and replace it. Okay, you saw me making the arbor and I already cut the first part on the first side and I will walk you through. Um, the arbor is tapped on the end M6 and I have a large aluminium washer with a, with a screw pressing everything together. And the arbor is uh, 0.2 millimeter shorter than the actual part so I get a clamping action. And it's a darn tight fit on there. Uh, finish on the arbor could be better, but uh, doesn't have any high spots, so um, we'll have to we'll have to. This is the first side, and due to the close fit on my arbor and the perfect runout of the arbor, I can flip the part around and machine the other side. Uh, shouldn't be an issue precision-wise. Tolerances on this part are not crazy, so I will get away with it. But before I do that, I will cut the first side on the second part and as you can see this is really a good tight fit um, 
it's it's sliding easy but you have to align it uh, properly to get it on screw goes in and I don't have to do anything no indicating because my OD runs true and when I machine my ID runs true and when I machine the OD it runs automatically true to the ID and my length is set because both parts are the same so here is my uh, CCMT turning tool with a polished insert for aluminium we start by turning the first shoulder Okay, turned the OD on this side and you might have noticed that I didn't get sprayed in chips as usually happens with brass if you run for example a high speed steel tool with zero degree top rake like my chamfering tool here. Uh, I get nice, nice running chips that break easily because brass is very brittle and that happens when you run a dead sharp tool in, in uh, leaded brass and I, I prefer this over getting sprayed with, with tiny tiny uh, chip <laughs> fragments so let's let's chamfer the, the edges just putting a, a tiny edge break on here um, so, so we don't have a, a sharp edge. Take our wrench. Now we can just take the part out, pull it off the arbor, and flip it 180. Like this. And bolt it down. And just for fun, we can check our runout on the previous machine section. That's pretty good. That's like that's like four micron after turning the part over, which is which is pretty okay. Okay, I am happy with this finish. Uh, this looks perfectly fine. Absolutely a serviceable finish. It's so shiny. Okay, hit my dimension. There we go. Edge break, and then the OD turning is done on this part. In fact, all turning is done on this part. <laughs> Did all the chamfering, check the dimensions. Time to pull it off. Uh oh <laughs> that's a problem. That can happen with brass. It shrunk down from the tension in the material. Whoops. So my fit between the arbor and the part is so so close that only due to the remaining stresses in the material, the trunk fit itself to the to the arbor and I just heated it up a little bit with the blowtorch and it came right off. And it didn't take much temperature difference. I will check the ID in a second again. 
but it should not have moved too much. The arbor we used previously, that was a little bit tight. I, I polished it down by maybe 10 microns, if, 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 if that at, at, at most. And now the part slides over it very nicely without an issue. Put it in the 5C indexer over here on the milling machine and I already edge finder the end of the part and centered side to side. That means I can lock the part now and do my final machining on this part without any issues. Uh, first we have to cut two flats, one on each side, drill a few holes and then cut long one millimeter wide slots, 1.1 millimeter wide slots over the length of these parts. Just doing a little bit of, of idiot checking and now we add a little more color that we can touch off properly. Okay, uh, uh, that's maybe point, point oh 0.01 millimeter deep, but to be sure, we will flip the part 180 degrees around, take a second take at the same depth setting, a cut, and mic the, the dimension across the flats. The funny thing about micrometers is they are always in the way. Okay, with that dimension I can now drop down to my final depth. So I'm working on these parts, aluminium 6082 and machine complete first side and then I parted them off and now I'm rechecking them in the sixth jaw with the hard jaws and I'm checking for run out on the machine section here and I get about eh, a little bit over 20, 20 micron. A little bit much, so I'm going to use the adjust screw function of this chuck get the run out down to zero or close to zero. And that's pretty simple. You look for the high and low spot on the, on the um, indicator here. You go to the low spot, then you go to the high spot. You, you take that range, divide it by two and add that and move the chuck from the lowest position to the center of that deviation makes completely sense I guess at least in my mind so we should be overshot a little bit usually it takes okay that's uh, close to zero as close as it gets
Yeah, it's always fun when the chip breaks nice and short. So basically complete opposite what happened here. <laughs> Okay, just check the thickness of the flange here. Now we go for our large boring bar. This boring bar is nice because it's just stupid rigid. <laughs> and then we bore the rear pocket. It seems that the rear pocket has no high precision requirements. It's just a 50 millimeter counter bore. And yes, um, breaking the chip would require basically a little bit more feed, higher speed. But as I run a manual machine, it's not always happening that you can break the chip actually. Uh, sometimes you just have to deal with a, a stringy mess of chips. That's the reality. Or you can try and play around for hours breaking the chip or just get the part done in time. <laughs> Oh, and one pro tip, when you grab a chip and want to pull it out the machine with the spindle off, if the chip gets snagged somewhere, don't pull. <laughs> don't pull and cut your hand open. Test it for you, it works, it bleeds like crazy. Uh, use a plier or a chip hook. Okay, that's one of the parts we prepared early on the lathe. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much of it I filmed. But basically, this is what comes off the lathe and just got some holes drilled into it, no, nothing else. But the drawing specs out an HDT timing belt profile in this area that we grooved off with two grooves or, or sectioned off. And this is the result I got. I cannot get in here because with a form cutter, with a wheel cutter, because there is no room for it. There is also no room for an end mill style profile cutter, because there is very little lead out. But there is room for a one millimeter ball end mill to 3D profile these on the CNC. And the idea is to cut one space between the teeth at a time on the CNC using the indexing, the manual indexing head and just indexing, cutting another gap, indexing and so on and so on and until I have 80 teeth on here. It takes some time, but it allows me to do this part in-house and not uh, have to, to farm it out, which is quite nice. I, I like to do things in-house. We have a face plate that's held in this in this recharge chuck of the indexing head. This is all a little bit hard because it's facing away from me from the operating side, uh, which doesn't exactly help with visibility. <laughs> so we get the stud here back in place. Drop our part in here. Here's a large plastic washer that goes into this stepped area of the part, like this. This goes on here, and we add a steel washer just to distribute the load. Now we will tighten this screw a little bit, this, this nut, and now I'm still able to shift this part around until it runs true, and for that we need an indicator. In this case, I'm just dropping on a dial test indicator into the spindle of the mill. Then I look for the high spot 
and do my usual indexing. Okay, that's well within 10 micron. Tighten this thing fully up to a solid medium grunt. Recheck our runout. Okay, we're good here. And we switch to our one millimeter two flute carbide ball end mill. I would have preferred an uncoded tool, but um, this is what I got, so has to work <laughs> as usual. And this was how it was programmed in CAM. I'm using a one millimeter ball end mill and first I'm roughing it out. I'm working always in one tooth space. Roughing it out with the ball end mill. And then I came with the same ball end mill in and did a parallel finish. It means the end mill goes back and forth and steps over a very small amount. In this case, I think it was like 30 microns per move and traces the contour that way. The machine has finished cutting the first of the teeth, or uh, more so the space between the teeth. Now we need to index it. For that, we open the lock of the indexing head. We go over here. We pull our index pin. Index half a rotation and drop the pin. And we take our backlash into consideration and don't overturn and turn back. Lock it and hit cycle start again. all the teeth of the timing belt profile that is required cut and I didn't even mess up the indexing which is good so let's pop this part off I'm a little bit careful because I don't want to smack the camera with the uh, with the wrench <laughs> so here's the part uh, came out quite nice I'm I'm happy. For a light duty CNC router, this went very well. Okay, that's one of the funkier parts of this of this batch that I have to make. And as you can see, we're set up on the milling machine and there are some deep slots cut into it. Let me pull the part off and quickly talk about it. It's just held in place with one single M6 screw in the center. Or bolt. There it is. This has some fairly deep face grooving and it could be done on the lathe. And I considered doing it on a lathe, but then I decided to do it on the mill because I was worried that the very thin walls here might start to vibrate under the cutting forces of a face grooving tool. And the small end mill, 3mm end mill, uh, stepping down in 1mm increments and then finishing the walls 
creates way less cutting forces and uh, behaves way nicer than a face grooving tool. So that's why I did it that way. It's slightly slower, of course. Uh, that's a lot of hand cranking or using the cordless drill on the rotary table. But the result is pretty good. The parts are prepared like this. They are already machined on the OD. Uh, this large ID here is machined and the thickness is correct. And also I drilled a hole through the center. The diameter of the center hole is not the final diameter. Uh, we will do that later. So we add a washer, a washer and a nut. And then we have to, to center this thing up. We disengage the worm of the rotary table so I can free spin it. And we give a little bit of drag on the nut that clamps apart. Just like this. Now I can get an indicator in here and do my usual play-by-play -play of indicating this thing in. I could use either a dial test indicator mounted to a table against the part or I can just use a spindle uh, test indicator. All my other indicator stands are at the moment in my second shop, in my other shop. So we will use this one. I will just turn the indicator around so you can actually see something. We're going to spin the rotary table like this, free spin it, uh, with the warm drive disengaged. Then to take a soft faced hammer um, and look at the dial, it's rising, it's up to 45 and it's down to minus 12. So we work in line of the indicator. And this should bring us pretty far off. Whoa. Okay, that's better. Uh, low spot. Low spot, split the difference. There we go. That's, uh, that's in the realm of 10 micron runout. Now we take a wrench here, lock this part in place and double check. No change to the runout. Now we want to center the spindle of the mill on the part. So now we spin the spindle. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> I, I had it centered from the last part. Um, there should not have been any major deviance. Get the indicator out of the way. And we're running a three flute, three millimeter carbide end mill with a DLC coating. Uh, that's a um, diamond like carbon uh, coating that doesn't add much thickness or corner, corner rounding, but prevents uh, aluminum to stick to the end mill. And also it's harder than the, the, the carbide it's on. I'm moving off center to the location that I figured out in CAD for roughing out the slot. And because we're roughing a lot of material away, uh, here is our, our fog buster, uh, minimum quantity lubrication system. I'm not a big fan of these. They work kinda, but they're always a hassle to set up and always a mess. 
So if I don't have to use it, I don't. But in this case, it's a good idea. Roughed it all out. I used the cordless drill on the hand crank of the rotary table just to speed things up. And now we need to finish the slots to size. For that, we go to the digital readout. 31.45, that's the center of the slot that I cut. But now I want to offset 0.35 millimeter to each side. I could add and subtract uh, the 0.35 millimeters from this and just move the table according to that. Or we switch to a second um, coordinate system. I usually use just absolute incremental as a secondary and zero it out. And when I switch back, I still have my 31.45 here. I switch over here and then I have zero to work off. Now I can just move my table 0.35 over and finish my slot to size. I'm just running compressed air because majority of the material is always already removed. We're running climb cuts, so we're going this direction and we're finishing the right wall first. And I'm going to take five millimeter increments in depth. Okay, when I finished taking my cleanup pass, I took a spring pass, cranked one or two more times, 360 degree around. Then I continued to hand crank and I moved the table over in the X direction to get back to the center of, of the slot without ever stopping 
stopping hand cranking the rotary table. That way I get a nice lead out and don't get a gouge mark from the end mill. Just like a CNC would move out of the contour on a radius path. cut and finished all the ribs and now that I have seen how this part behaves here on the milling machine I'm very confident that you could without much issues cut it on the lathe with a pre-panning tool. But that's always the point when you make a decision on a part. In this, in this case I, went, uh, I, I played safe. I went for milling which is in my experience less of an issue with thin walled parts. Uh, thin walls can start to vibrate like crazy on a lathe. On a mill with a uh, with a high helix cutter like this, there's a 45 degree uh, helix angle, very positive cutting action. It's less of an issue usually. On a lathe, we will take a, a chamfering tool now and, and break the edges, and we will do the same here on the mill. Break the tool loose. Unscrewing it completely because the fog buster and the air blast has have blown a lot of crap up into the collet and the nut. And we we clean those out before we put it back together. Yeah, I need to make a ER wiper for my, for my for the mill tooling. Yes, you can buy them. They are for some odd reason very expensive. And I have to keep up with my reputation to be a bloody cheapskate so I'm going to make one probably 3d print it and then glue some felt on it using a 90 degree four flute chamfer end mill and I'm going to drop down in the center of the slot and deburr both sides at once There we go. That's the first side of the part finished. Now I can pull it off the fixture and re-put it on there offset. Because the backside features are <laughs> offset. I flipped the part around still on my aluminum subplate, bolted it down. It's centered on the rotary table currently. And I bolted down two 
uh, tooling blocks here and here. They contact uh, the part and they're aligned in the X travel of the rotary table. Because I need to shift this part four millimeter off center, don't want to, to have the part move sideways. So basically, I have a, a digital indicator here that I have zeroed. I can open this nut. So by removing the stud in the center, I should be able to move the part three, uh, like four millimeters. And reclamp it. There we go. That's four millimeter on the on the indicator. Now I can put two small scrap clamps here and here, hold the part down, cut the center and some additional features. Then I can reclamp to the center and cut the rest. Quite simple. <laughs> so let's add some strap clamps, some tiny clamps. Yeah, um, somebody made that subplate with M5 threads, but all my small setup hardware is M6. So that's quite clever. So we have to use standard screws in this case. Okay, got the part clamped down with two small strap clamps supported by some gauge blocks. And I just miss did the, the setup wrong. I don't need four millimeter offset, I need two millimeter offset, so... But I'm in a lucky situation that I have these guide blocks and moving the part over two millimeters will be a no-brainer. I cut the internal diameter and this inner step. Now I have to change the, the clamping to clamp from the inside through a central bolt and cut, cut an outside step so we are left with a small uh, narrow ridge. I think I can use, yeah, I have a, a piece of, a piece of uh, PVC. I'm going to use this as a hold down. and a single uh, hold down bolt in the center, like this. Drop a nut on here. Quick, quick check for clearance, so we don't run our, our colored nut into the stud. But that looks safe. So let's tighten this down. Yeah. 
and remove those outer strap clamps. This way we are able to switch our setup from from one clamping situation to another one without disturbing the location of the part. And due to our fence, the setup, the, the changeover to the next part will be that simple. So we drop down, we leave the perimeter of the part, drop down, and I think Yeah, we start on this side because this is the most it's uh, offset in this direction. And I'm still running the radius the, the distance of the spindle to the center of the rotary table. So the diameter I'm going to cut is 49.9. .9. We have to add the diameter of the cutter. Uh, four millimeter, and then divide by two. 26.95 is our center, center line distance of the cutter to the center of the order table to get our, our dimension. The last component to this batch of parts are these chunks of brass. When you order brass like this, there is already a decent amount of money involved because brass is horrendous expensive and that was two years ago. These days it's probably double the price I paid back then. So I started by tree panning out the center of the brass slugs, just tree panning in and hammering out the core just to save some material. Then after coring out the slug, I bored, I did all the ID work, still in the soft jaw chuck. I needed soft jaws because a regular 125mm jaw chuck cannot grab 150mm OD. That's a very unsafe condition. So I used soft jaws and bored them out very far out. After the ID work, I changed to the six jaw chuck and clamped Part from the inside and that allowed me to do all the OD and face work on these parts. And that's already pretty much all the lathe work. From now on it's all milling machine. Okay, I'm working on the last part of this, this project. Looks like a solid ring but the other side is completely hollow and this is a fairly precise part. And due to the fact that it's very thin-walled, I made these huge pie jaws. These grip with very little distortion. And they grip not only on the OD here, but they also support this inner ring here. So it's reasonably stable when I do my milling work here on the CNC router. The three-jaw chuck is just bolted to the table with a central bolt. I can do this in this case because uh, the cutting forces are very low and chances of torquing the, the chuck off is minimal or non-existent. <laughs> so 
um, I'm doing the old rotation, slight rotation, just to seat it nicely and make sure there is no dirt or something like that. And then we just tighten it down ever so slightly. This is, by the way, this is super useful. This is a small, a small ratchet, but it's uh, three, three, three quarter in, three eighths inch uh, drive, and I made adapters for all my different chucks. Uh, these are just extensions. Uh, again, uh, three eighths inch uh, socket extensions. And I surface ground them to the right size to fit into my chucks. And this is a, a micro stepping or a micro ratchet. Very, very small angle needed. And when you work close to the table or something like that, it's super useful. And it's not as big and unwieldy as a normal 3 8 inch uh, ratchet. So very useful, super uh, cheapy. This is like a five, five euro ratchet uh, from eBay. So now we can use a dial test indicator to center on this diameter. I have my indicator here in this holder and a and a, and a collet chuck. This goes in the spindle. I have to be a little bit careful. And then we can drop the spindle down a little bit. bring the indicator into contact with the work. I did one already yesterday, so the chuck was already dialed in. But when you leave a machine overnight and you rehome it and you had thermal growth over the day, it will be off. Not much. In this case, I'm in X direction off by 20 microns and in Y 30 microns. And I'm back to to center. We zero out both axes and we get rid of the indicator. <laughs> it's easier when you can get the tool actually out. Uh, I'm going to use two tools for this part. One is a 1.5 millimeter two fluid end mill and one is a 0.6 millimeter three fluid end mill. This is the, the 1.5. This goes in the spindle. And we we touch off on, on the surface of the part here. Uh, using a four millimeter gauge block here. And I like to drop the cutter below the height of the, the gauge block. And then gently push the gauge block up against the cutter. And then jog the spindle up in 10 micron increments until the gauge block fits under there. And then I just hit this number, this thickness is a 4 millimeter gauge block into the DRO of the CNC controller. Okay. This is the last part I had made for this batch of parts. Uh, and this is by far the most complicated one. You have seen all the milling done on the on the CNC router. I was just set up here to drill for 0.7 millimeter holes. So nothing special and it's done now. But when I take it out, 
this chunk of material started with a weight of, I think, around two and a half kilograms, and now it's down to 230 grams. It's a customer part. I don't exactly know what the part is for, and I have to trust the the, the customer, the engineer's design decision. If it's not anything stupid like a 150 millimeter deep 2H7 hole, but I don't see anything stupid. It's just a complicated part. That's the reality of making parts. You don't make money by making flat bars with five holes. You make money by making parts like this. So whenever you see a complicated part, don't, don't scream right away at the engineer. Look at the drawing, um, maybe ask. Sometimes the engineer can tell you, if he wants to, what the F you're building there, or he is building, or designing, and, uh, or sometimes he might only say, just make the darn part to print. That's because you're a machinist, not because you're here to discuss drawings. So let's let's uh, pack this last one up and finish this. Okay, there we go. All six parts done. These two were done completely manual. Uh, all these and these, all the lathe work was manual and the milling was done on the CNC mill. And in hindsight, uh, it was kind of stupid to, 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 to start doing them manually. But and here we have a flashback when I had the brilliant idea to do those parts manually on the milling machine. Set it up on the rotary table, figured out all my coordinates and head at it. It worked quite fine. I did two parts like that and then I made just a simple mistake. And that cost me quite a bit of money because I had to order a new chunk of material. So you can make these parts manually. But you have to be not just laser focused, more like electron beam focused. And that was when my dad came into the shop, saw that I messed up one part and taunted me why I'm not using the CNC. And I was like, duh, CNC? Yeah, and that's that story. So I proceeded on on the CNC, of course. When I started doing them and I looked at the, the, the depth and the mass of material that has to be removed, I was in serious doubt that the CNC router, the easel router, can handle it. But it showed, after I messed up one, <coughs> that I tried it on. I, I, I took the scrap part, put it on the CNC rather, run a few tool paths and uh, it, it went very well. So I decided to run all the remaining parts on the CNC router and the result was perfect. These parts stack together very nicely. There are uh, three parts make up one assembly and they stack together perfectly. So that's that. Um, even if you're half decent experienced, you make mistakes. Either by choosing the wrong machine and technology to, to run on, or you just mess up a part by reading a wrong number. So, things happen. But, cost me one chunk of material, which is fairly expensive. Um, I got about four buckets of brass chips out of it, which is also quite a bit of money. So that's that, and yeah, hope you enjoyed, thank you all for watching, and I'll be back.